bridging the skills gap across industry subsectors is vital to the future of modern manufacturing. The Manufacturing Institute is increasing its investment in FAME, the Federation for Advanced Manufacturing Education, the preeminent Earn and Learn Manufacturing Apprenticeship. Since 2010, FAME has expanded from a pilot program at Toyota's Kentucky plant to an initiative spanning 13 states and involving nearly 400 companies, helping to make new connections between companies, educational institutions, and students. And through our growing workforce development portfolio, we'll partner with Stand Together to promote second chance hiring, changing lives, and addressing our industry's workforce crisis. With the help of the Creators Wanted Fund, we'll fuel the growth of modern manufacturing. Welcome to today's webinar on Second Chance Hiring. I'm Cassie Zumbiel, Director of Workforce Initiatives for the Manufacturing Institute, and I'm so excited to have you all here today for our first webinar on Second Chance Hiring. Quickly, I wanted to go over some housekeeping. On the right of your screen, you'll see a chat box. I would love if you all could kick it off by putting your name and organization in the chat. Come on, go do it. Throughout the conversation today, feel free to add comments and questions. We'll be monitoring the chat and trying to get to all of your questions. You can also find the agenda with all of our guest speakers' information and a link to take a survey at the end of the webinar. Please tweet and post your thoughts about our conversation today with the hashtag Second Chance Workforce. You can find the hashtag at the bottom of the screen throughout the webinar, just in case you forget. Now, to kick us off, I'm going to turn it over to Carolyn Lee, Executive Director of the Manufacturing Institute. Carolyn, over to you. Thank you, Cassie. I'm glad to be here today to talk about this new work. The MI's diverse initiatives support all American workers, including emerging workers, women, veterans, and students through skilled training programs, community building, and career growth. As the 501c3 nonprofit workforce development and education partner for the National Association of Manufacturers, the Manufacturing Institute is a trusted advisor to manufacturers, equipping them with the resources necessary to solve the industry's toughest challenges. Despite a loss of almost of over 500,000 manufacturing jobs due to the pandemic in the last year and skyrocketing national unemployment rates, manufacturing continues to face a talent shortage with 700,000 manufacturing jobs open in March of this year. As business leaders ramp up production, job postings have risen to stratospheric levels. These data are an encouraging sign that manufacturers feel confident enough in their economic outlook to post new jobs. Yet at the same time, manufacturers continue to tell us that attracting and retaining workers remains one of their top challenges. Unfortunately, this is not a problem that looks like it's going to go away if we continue with the status quo. According to our updated Deloitte Manufacturing Institute talent study that was released just last month, we will have 2.1 million jobs that will likely go unfilled by the end of the decade. And that could mean up to $1 trillion in lost economic impact for the U.S. in 2030 alone. According to the survey of U.S. manufacturers for the study, finding the right talent is now 36% harder than it was in 2018, the last time we did the study, even though the unemployment rate has nearly doubled since then. And over three quarters of manufacturers say that they, have on, they will have ongoing difficulties in attracting and retaining workers in 2021 and beyond. In order to address these challenges and close the skills gap, manufacturers must expand their talent pool and bring all workers off the sidelines. That's one of the many reasons we have launched our Second Chance Hiring Initiative. Partnering with Stand Together and with a grant from the Charles Koch Institute, the MI is helping manufacturers welcome into the workforce millions of Americans who have been excluded simply due to a criminal record, helping to close the skills gap and strengthen society. One in three Americans possesses a criminal record and over 600,000 are released from incarceration every year. Second Chance Hiring gives businesses an opportunity to welcome highly motivated, engaged, productive, and loyal new team members that may otherwise be overlooked. Manufacturers are well positioned to, well, to lead in welcoming people into their workforce who are ready and willing to develop their skills and seize the second chance for a promising future. To kick us off today, I would like to introduce Jeff Korzanek, author of Untapped Talent, How Second Chance Hiring Works for Your Business and the Community, and Chief Investment Officer for Fifth Third Bank. Jeff has become the expert in the business case 
of second chance hiring and the best practices for hiring individuals with criminal records. Jeff, I will turn it over to you and we'll be back with you at the end of your presentation for a short Q&A. Thank you very much, uh, Carolyn. I, I think it's important for the American business community and manufacturers to understand just what we're facing in the United States. And we're facing a growth problem. And this uh, will be obscured by the immediate run up in demand after the pandemic uh, it ends, but is something we have to face long term. And this is based on the growth components of any economy uh, in, in the world. And that's the growth potential is defined by how fast can you grow your labor force and how fast can you grow their productivity? This is data historic. And then on the right-hand side, a projection of uh, growth for the United States created by the Congressional Budget Office. And the green line, uh, which is declining, is our workforce growth. So this is the source of our challenge in the decades ahead. We are not growing our workforce as quickly as we would like to for a more robust growth environment. And that blue line productivity can only make up so much of it. Productivity growth tends to be cyclical. It comes and goes, but demographics are defining our destiny. And unfortunately, the situation is only getting worse. The data you see in front of us is some demographic related data from the, uh, the data bank uh, managed by the St. Louis Federal Reserve Bank. The top chart is fertility rates in the United States. How many children can a woman uh, be expected to have over her lifetime? And you can see that uh, we're in a very different environment from the left-hand side of the chart, which was the tail end of the baby boom uh, generation, and that we're currently expecting a fertility rate of 1.78 children uh, per, per woman. Here's the problem. Just to replace our current population, you need a fertility rate of 2.1, replacing the mother and father, that's two, and then an allowance for infant and early mortality. So if workforce growth is dependent, is a function of, is an ingredient for growing your economy, we are going to be challenged in the years and decades ahead. Birth rates peaked cyclically in 1990. We've got that millennial generation largely in the workforce. We just didn't have enough births 20, 25 years ago to sustain workforce growth. Now, the solution, of course, can be that we dig deeper into our population, find people who are not in the labor force and get them in the labor force. Economists call that labor force participation rates. And that's the chart you see on the bottom. This goes back to 1948. You can see in the middle of that chart that rising labor force participation rate. That was the entry of the baby boomers into the workforce. That was the entry of uh, women into the workforce and uh, en masse. Uh, that was associated with rising labor force participation rates. And one of the reasons we grew so quickly in the 80s and 90s. But not only has labor force participation rates been declining since 2000 on the right-hand side of that, that bottom chart, the pandemic has also taken a toll. We've knocked out workers, older workers who had been staying in the workforce appeared to be leaving for good. We've seen women, some men, yes, but predominantly women leave the workforce in order to raise children at a time when schools have uh, largely been uh, closed to, to uh, in-classroom uh, study. So all of these have cost us in terms of workforce growth. The answer still has to lie in this bottom chart. We still have to look for opportunities to dig deeper into our population, find these pockets of untapped talent if we're going to restore decent levels of growth to the U.S. economy. Which brings us to second chance hiring. We have a very large population of people who have been touched by the criminal justice system. Of the various measures here, I choose to focus on the one that's highlighted in orange. Those are the 19 million Americans who have a felony conviction on their record. I focus on this because a felony conviction is a particular obstacle to employment. Now, of these 19 million, Somewhat over a million are currently incarcerated, so they are, of course, out of the workforce. Some of them are, uh, have aged out of the workforce uh, already. But there are millions, many millions, who are of workforce age and have the possibility of becoming productive employees. Some are in the workforce, to be sure, but virtually all of them are unable to participate to the fullest extent of their uh, possibility of their talents because of barriers, 
whether hard barriers, uh, licensing restrictions and so forth, or the stigma against workers uh, who have this kind of background. So this is a large pool to draw on to say that people with felonies are not part of the solution would be to say that every one of these 19 million individuals can't be a good employee. Of course, that's ridiculous. Perhaps not all of them are a viable talent pool, but many of them, and that many must number in the millions are. So the question then becomes, can we tap this resource? And it turns out that there's a model of success that not only creates a viable talent pool from, from this population, but creates not an employee of last resort, not, a, uh, not an adequate employee, but actually very strong employees. And the model, and this is not an academic model, but one that has been created by studying the behavior of six successful second chance employers around the country, companies that have intentionally focused on this talent pool and have found ways to make it work. The model consists of two, combining two processes process for identifying who's ready for employment. Typically, this is done in conjunction with nonprofits that have built a relationship with people with criminal backgrounds and can attest to uh, issues like character and readiness. Do they have the soft skills, perhaps training in hard skills as well, as well as a support process. And this support process, again, it is provided through the employer, but it often relies on nonprofit partners or government agencies, which recognizes that this population typically comes with various kinds of skills gaps. Sometimes it's soft skills, sometimes it's hard skills, or sometimes it's things that many of us take for granted. Easy access to credit, easy access to transportation, to housing. And employers have found that if they can find the tools and make those tools available to this population to solve those gaps, they get an exceptionally good employee. We're used to models of employment with traditional candidates that result in a dispersion of capability. You have an average employee for any population in your company, and some are worse and some are better. And while as an employer, you're always trying to move that average to the right, always trying to improve the level of your workforce, we all understand sometimes employees aren't, uh, aren't as good as that average, and you're spending time either trying to coach them up or, or get them out. And you have star performers on the, other, on the flip side, and these are people who are often uh, at risk of being recruited away. So you end up managing this, this, this pool and this bell curve shape distribution. But with the true second chance model, this model that combines a process for understanding who's ready for employment and combines it with a support mechanism so that those employees thrive, you actually get a different result. You get an employee who is, on average, more engaged and more loyal. And the Two large-scale studies, one done of U.S. military uh, felony uh, waivers for enlistment, the other done by the Johns Hopkins Hospital System, as well as some unpublished studies that, that have not been publicly available, all point in the same direction. When you get this model in place, when you tweak it for your local conditions, the needs of your companies, you can end up with adding workers who are exceptionally engaged and exceptionally loyal. How does that translate to your bottom line? Well, of course, engagement and loyalty um, make for employers who, uh, employees who are more productive. They get to stay in place over time. So you save turnover costs, but more productive employees who stay in place tend to be more profitable employees as well. So this is a model that works. Why does it work? I think it's important to recognize that people who come out of uh, a, a criminal records, uh, particularly those with incarceration, face a mountain of obstacles. And the process of re-entry and being ready simply to apply for a job and be a viable candidate often reflects a tremendous commitment to bettering themselves and to, uh, and to uh, rebuilding their life. I think most of us can think of a time in our own lives where we fell down, fell short of what who we wanted to be. It's no different for this population. Those with character choose to redouble their efforts to prove that they are more than their worst mistake. As employers, we can not only help this process, but we can take advantage of that and get a superior workforce. 
It's important to know that it's not uh, uh, an all or nothing proposition. Uh, there are steps that employers can take to explore this. If I were to pick a single step, I'd ask employers who are thinking about this to go visit another manufacturer who's already doing this. They are uh, around the country, uh, people who have uh, found uh, this works for their business Go visit them, invest in the time. Most of these employers are very willing to share their experience uh, and their expertise, and they've come to believe in this and understand that it is in the benefit of all of us to grow our workforce and uh, in the course of growing with this workforce uh, to offer opportunities so that we can live up to our aspiration to be the land of opportunity for all. With that, I'll say thank you. Thank you, Jeff. And, you know, I've heard the presentation before and it is striking every single time the opportunity that we have here. So, you know, before we let you go, I'd like to take a few minutes to dive deeper into some of your work with questions um, from our team. And um, let's start at the beginning. So as you as you began the research for your book, what was the one thing that really surprised you about second chance hiring? What was your kind of this is the key? It. it, it um it's probably just how good these employees can be. Uh, when you get down to meeting the individuals, you understand that the journey that people have taken um, can show people who uh, don't have accomplishment in traditional means, you know, they don't have uh, you know, PhDs or a long list of traditional business accomplishments, but when you understand where they started from and what they had to overcome, you realize these can be people of tremendous character and dedication and the kind of people you would want to have on your workforce. You know, I was just thinking about your comment about um, people being better than their worst mistake. And I think that, that that's really resonated with me because I think it really says a lot about the potential and the opportunity. So um, speaking of, of opportunity, you've, you've often highlighted a few manufacturers who are leaders in this space who have done a tremendous job really um, in, in employing uh, folks who, with a criminal uh, record or criminal past. And, you know, do you think that there's anything unique about them that differs um, from what they've done uh, than other industries that you've worked with, specifically about manufacturing? Well, uh, you know, I'm a great believer in manufacturing in the United States. We've often written about reshoring of manufacturing. I think the manufacturing community in general has become incredibly innovative. When you look at the decade challenge of outsourcing jobs abroad, um, those who have survived that tend to be exceptionally innovative business people. And the those manufacturers who've undertaken second chance hiring tend to be among the most innovative. So it may be an innovative innovative hiring process, but what you see is that level of innovation permeates their businesses and it's evident they're just good businesses uh, in their own right. Absolutely. And I think that that stands even stronger why this is a great um, value or a great opportunity for manufacturers. So we do have many business leaders watching um, the, this here today, you know, and as an economist and an expert in second chance hiring, what's the one thing you want to um, want them to leave this conversation with? You know, I, I, I think uh, the one thing is to understand that this is possible. This makes sense. This is business, not charity. Absolutely. And, you know, I think that that's um, tremendous. You know, there's a lot of, of good, what is it? It's, it's doing, doing good by doing well, doing well by doing good. You know, there's a lot of good we can do, but it makes so much economic sense. And the labor force numbers, um, the 700,000 open jobs we have in our sector, we need an all of the above solution, and that includes reaching all populations. So thank you for your time, Jeff. Thank you for your enthusiasm and your leadership. It's clear uh, why you were such a, a key um, a leader in this space. And so we really appreciate you being here with us today. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks, Jeff and Carolyn. It was important to kick off today's discussion by explaining the talent shortage that manufacturers are facing. Jeff really illuminated why this is not an issue that's going away and why we need to begin to find new solutions. I wanna reiterate the model of success that Jeff discussed. There are two keys to success in second chance hiring. First is utilizing a community-based organization to identify who's ready for employment. Manufacturers should utilize these organizations as partners as they engage in second chance hiring. And the second piece is an employer internal support process that supports individuals with barriers they may be facing. Jeff highlighted that there are nonprofit partners and government agencies to help solve the gaps. 
Organizations like your local workforce, de- workforce Development Board would be one great place to start. We, at the Manufacturing Institute, are also here to support you to find these local partners, and we'll be releasing resources that'll help manufacturers learn how to make the most out of these partnerships and truly support their hires. We'll tell you how to access those at the end of the webinar. Also, we're happy to connect you with manufacturers who are doing second chance hiring to go visit, as Jeff mentioned. Up next, we're going to hear from a group of partners, including a manufacturer, a community-based organization, a sector partnership, and a hire. Does that sound familiar? It's a great example of that model of success that we just discussed. They'll discuss how they came together in their community to start a second chance hiring program. The program's grown so much since I first spoke with them a year ago when they were kicking off their first cohort, so I'm looking forward to hearing from them. First, a quick reminder, keep asking those questions in the chat and engaging in social media using the hashtag Second Chance Workforce. Now, I'm going to turn it over to Adam Snyder, who leads the Workforce Connect sector partnership in the Cleveland area. Adam exemplifies a workforce development leader, and I'm looking forward to hearing him moderate the panel today. Adam, over to you. Thanks, Cassie. We are really excited today to talk about an initiative going on in Cleveland Cuyahoga County around workforce development, around the skills gap in manufacturing, and some innovative new things that are going on that are being led by our manufacturers and key partners in the area. My name is Adam Snyder. I work for Magnet, which is a part of the Ohio MEP network, and my role is to lead the Workforce Connect Manufacturing Sector Partnership in Cleveland Cuyahoga County. At the core of sector partnership, the belief is employer-led, employer-owned. So our core work on the intermediary team of the sector partnership is to facilitate a vision and strategies and execution of a demand-driven path set by the manufacturers to help align our key partners in education and workforce, as well as our employers to to deliver on that skills gap and, and really close it over time. That work started about two years ago. We brought a dozen manufacturing executives together, C-suite, owner, CEO, COO level folks together to set a vision and strategies for the sector partnership. Out of that process came a number of work streams that are really inspiring in how we're going to do that work. The key one that we're going to talk about today came out of a strategy to develop innovative on-ramps to manufacturing for historically underrepresented populations. That strategy came about really grounded in the reality that manufacturing historically has not done a great job recruiting young people, people of color and women into manufacturing and really wanted to execute on this strategy in a way that also helped drive awareness for manufacturing to develop these on-ramps and create a splash in the community to have people look at manufacturing and go, wow, look what they're doing. This is fantastic, both in the outcomes and in the methods that things are happening. You're going to meet a team of folks today that are going to tell different aspects of that story. We have Jack Schron with us, who will speak from the manufacturing leadership team perspective as as the CEO of one of our leadership manufacturers. You'll meet Jill Rizica, the executive director of Towards Employment, one of our core workforce development partners. And you'll meet Corey Webb, a graduate of the program you're gonna learn about today, who is an employee at Juergens and doing phenomenally in his role and and advancing in his career now post-graduation of the program. The Access to Manufacturing Careers program, our focus of the conversation today, was a collaborative design between manufacturers and workforce and education partners, really designed as an aggregated entry level path for initially the target population of of re-entry. We had a number of manufacturers that had been hiring from the reentry population and providing those second chance opportunities for a number of years and were able to tell their peers about how productive those those hires were, how loyal the employees were, the great stories that were coming out of those. And as an element of that, the manufacturers were excited by the competitive advantage for manufacturing in a a competitive uh, labor environment where there are sectors that, that... have collateral sanctions and restrictions on hiring people with backgrounds. And so manufacturers got together. We're going to learn about kind of what drove those decisions, how that process went, and some of the outcomes today. So I'll welcome Jack, Jill, and Corey to the group. And Jack, maybe you can start us off talking about 
why you got involved in the sector partnership in general uh, as, as a leader, uh, why your organization's involved, and then maybe why, uh, why this reentry focus and why this program was something that got you and your team excited. Thanks, Adam. I, I really appreciate it. And, and uh, I'm thrilled to be here on this panel today uh, because I think it's a message that we need to get out loud and clear. And why did Jurgens, a manufacturer of uh, work holding and clamping components of 80 years, want to get involved in something like the sector partnership? And it was it became obvious that uh, uh, where you were taking this and why we as a, uh, a management team wanted to get involved in this uh, from our, our point of view and the others was because we knew that the skills labor shortage, just because uh, we were all focusing on it, wasn't gonna get done just because we wanted it to. We had to actually take action steps. You could not, uh, so often uh, government panels and things of that nature get started with, with a high level thought, but without necessarily action steps that you have brought to the table. And so that's why I got excited about it uh, because this was gonna be action oriented uh, with 16, 17 of our starting companies all uh, involved with everything from mid-sized to large to small, uh, we're in the mid-size range, and uh, we were looking for for workforce. There's no question about it. Uh, the sector partnership was going to target uh, different groups. We, you, we came in with a clean uh, sheet of paper. We had no idea what was going to be on the idea, but as we started to develop and talk about it, we all knew as it started to percolate into good things and good ideas that new things were going to bubble on up uh, into it. And so uh, that's uh, we'll wait to, to get to the access portion of it later on, but why we as sector partnership knew that uh, uh, we were going to be building um, this growth network. And I think it's kind of fun uh, because we as a group targeted that we will be the manufacturing educational capital for the entire United States. And that's, the, that's our driving force uh, for where we are. And I think it's a great mission. Excellent. And, and as a component to that education capital vision, this, this program, the Access to Manufacturing Careers program, the development of a curriculum that really meets the entry level needs of an aggregated number of manufacturers. We started with about six, and we now have 23 organizations, manufacturing employers that are at the table driving the execution uh, now post development of this program and hiring graduates out. Jill, could you share a bit about uh, your organization and how it fits into this and, and where you saw the development of access to manufacturing careers as unique in your work with reentry population? Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Adam, and, and happy to, to be here. Um, Towards Employment is um, over 40 year old community based workforce development organization it helps people who need a helping hand uh, connect to a job, prepare for a job, get a job, keep a job and advance in, in their career. Um, and we had been preparing people for manufacturing jobs, um, but not in um, not in this organized way, organized and targeted way. So we also, um, over the course of a year, um, pre-COVID, we're placing around 400 people a year in jobs, and um, over 60% of those individuals had some criminal justice involvement, which is really just a reflection of um, communities uh, of, of Cleveland. Um, that have high levels of criminal justice involvement. Um, so we had experience uh, working in manufacturing and also working with um, the target population that the sector partnership was interested in. Um, we were really excited to be part of the planning process, um, working with the um, sector partnership having convened the employers, having heard what their priorities were, what their uh, targeted positions, uh, where they were feeling some pain that seemed like a good match for um, an entry level uh, talent pipeline. Um, and then really breaking down uh, what were the skills and competencies needed for that position. Let's take away existing credentials. Um, we examined a number of different entry level credentials and it was a little bit of what from column A, what from column B, what, it, what is the most accelerated way to get the skills needed um, to prepare somebody for these jobs. And then the second layer of conversation was about um, working with a talent pool that the employers may not have had a lot of experience with, what preparation um, was needed in terms of potentially um, debunking any myths, um, promoting 
um, good uh, thinking about what makes for good supervision practices in supporting um, somebody who may have come out of incarceration. Um, so also uh, conversations about what supports are available and also about um, employer practices um, in, in ways to create a supportive environment. And so that the those part that partnership and that discussion, I think, has really led to a robust uh, and exciting program. Great. Thanks, Jill. And, and at this point in the process, I would mention that we're now uh, midstream on our for fourth cohort, and one of our graduates joining us today from a previous cohort, a great example of um, the dedication and, and commitment to, to that learning, and would love Corey to introduce himself, tell us um, where you work and your role, and, and maybe a little background on how, why you got interested, why you got involved with the access program, had, had you even known about manufacturing in the past and, and what your way into that program looked like? Uh, hello, my name is Corey Webb. Um, I started um, I started this program because I thought it would be a great opportunity for me to uh, gain a career in um, manufacturing, uh, machine operating. And uh, towards employment, they did, uh, they did a pretty good job as far as on um, getting me prepared for um, the road and um, <clears throat> getting me prepared here and whatnot for uh, machine operating. And um, it was just a really good opportunity for me. And uh, I feel blessed that uh, Towards Employment gave me this opportunity to be uh, to, to take me as far as that I can go in this career, as far as on uh, machine operating. And um, tell me what... Uh Maybe what was your what what do you feel like was your either your favorite or the most important part of the program while you were going through it? My favorite uh, was hands on experience. Like I never did anything far as on with calipers and things like that, and uh, they really took their time with everybody to to make sure that you had a necessary skill to even you know go into the manufacturing um, positions and stuff like that. But overall, I, I, and another thing that I liked about it was uh, the Zoom classes. Throughout the pandemic, they made it easy and, and uh, accessible for you to um, <clears throat> for you to actually um, be, get involved into the program. Great. And following that program, uh, Corey and and his uh, his peer graduates went through an interview day process. So I mentioned. We have now 23 employers engaged with this program uh, and growing all the time as people hear about great outcomes. As you went through that interview process and found Jurgens and Jurgens found you, I, I'd now love to hear, looking back on that, what, would, what has been the best part of working in manufacturing? What do you like best about your job now? Um, that would, because these are things that, that people want to know, you know, what it, they don't see in plants. You know, the, the folks that live in our communities, don't see inside manufacturing facilities very often. So share with us, what do you, what do you love about your job? What are you looking forward to about your job in the future? Well, there's so much, there's so much uh, stuff here to learn, you know? So, uh, and the team here, they, uh, they, they always willing to help you. You can ask any types of questions and they answer them for you and they take your time. They take their time with you to make sure you learn machines correctly. That way you can get a proficient, um, quality of work done at times. And overall, it's a great experience. Um, I recommend it to anybody that would be interested in it. And um, I just love everything about it and uh, everything that is, that is brought to me. And um, <clears throat> I'm just so excited to, to be here. Great. As, as somebody who fell in love with manufacturing uh, many years ago, it's great to hear that excitement from somebody who just jumped in fairly recently. Jill, maybe let, let's come back to some of the building blocks and elements that boiled into the access program that makes it a little unique. And, and maybe you could share a bit about how you how your organization approaches the supports uh, for the folks that are interested from screening all the way through uh, post-placement. 
Sure. So um, one thing to, to note and that um, is different about this partnership is while Towards Employment is delivering the, the training, um, there is a whole network of providers across the community that are involved in identifying, sourcing, and referring uh, people interested in, in, um, in, in this program. And so through that, we're able to leverage really community-wide resources um, and develop partnerships and collaboration in ways that we weren't able to before. Um, and so that has been, uh, that has been a, a tremendous um, part of this. One of the things that um, is just embedded in, in our work is um, this idea of holistic wraparound services. So uh, we recognize we want to meet people where they're at. We look at what their career goals are and their education and experience is one set of workforce readiness. But the other set is something you might refer to as social determinants of work, like what's going on in the home life that could prevent somebody from getting to work on time, focusing on work, being able to think about advancement. And so that could be anything from um, uh, somebody, you know, stable housing, um, getting, you know, childcare or uh, equipment that's needed to, to be able to work to longer term, you know, issues if there is, you um, um, a child support issue. If you, someone who has been incarcerated may come out with child support arrears that, that triggers a whole bunch of additional things that are complicated and can get in the way. Um, transportation issues, um, whether it's, um, you know, mental health or, or former substance abuse and making sure that you are, um, you know, stable and supported to continue um, along your pathway. So really having that holistic view, um, it, it, it's part of the, of, of the program to help um, identify your goals and then work backwards to say what's needed to support you to achieve those goals and, and trying to have the most holistic perspective on that. And that is direct support what, that we're able to provide, but also again, relying on community connections and community resources um, to be able to bring that all together. Great. And the, the elements of those are, are a great example of how the sector partnership provides value to our community and, and all of our stakeholders. And the ability to design a program that boils things in like 12 months of post-placement advancement coaching from skilled coaches on Jill's team uh, really leads to outcomes. And although it's early and we're through three soon to be four cohorts, it's really exciting to be talking about 70, 75% placement rates with over 80% of our graduates being people of color and 90 day retention rates on some of our initial cohorts being over 60%. These are, these are ratios that we're very proud of. And as we look to grow and scale this program uh, and have more and more impact for the, for the employers that are engaged, I'd love to hear from Jack the, the successes that you're seeing both from a, a leader in the sector partnership, but also as an, a hiring employer of some of these great, great candidates and employees. What do you see as the impact to your organization as well as to our manufacturing community? Well, I think it, uh, if nothing else uh, would tell the story better, it was uh, uh, Corey smile when you asked that question about manufacturing. I didn't have to, we're in completely different parts of the building. And so uh, as, a, as a human being, as, uh, as somebody who cares about uh, all of, of God's work, uh, it, it, that, that just made me feel so good. But just to go back to the manufacturing sector, we have this talent pool and we're all looking for, for great talent. Well, imagine how many, if we can find multiple, multiple Corys out there in all places and with 52 successes right off the bat, um, all manufacturers, if they could have that kind of success rate of their hiring, uh, if they compare it, they would say, wow, this is, th these are winning numbers. And not only are they winning as their manufacturer, please consider it at your own company, but then think of a bigger societal benefit also. Uh, that uh, we're, we're making a contribution. So this is a win-win-win all around, you know, the smile of Corey. Uh, we as a company at Jurgens have now had a, a, a new talent uh, that's on board uh, and uh, societal benefit. Uh, it just, everyone wins out of this. Uh, and as a as part of the sector partnership, I've just been thrilled that, 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 that we identified this as a group and uh, we have other groups we've identified and, uh, and we're really looking forward to this being a big success. Great. Thanks, Jack. And one of the, the great elements of how this played out, we talked about this collaborative design of the Access to Manufacturing Careers program that initially was targeting the reentry population. The manufacturers that were driving the, 
uh, young adult and youth aspect of the sector partnership work also saw this curriculum and saw this momentum building and decided to take on and tweak the access to manufacturing careers curriculum and apply it for opportunity youth. And so that, that is emerging. We'll, we'll look forward to sharing outcomes and results from another population that has the potential to be super fruitful and is also a, a difficult uh, group of, of young folks to inspire and bring into manufacturing, particularly when they don't know about it. So um, Corey, if you'd be, if you'd be willing to close us out, I would love to, to put you on the spot and say, if, if somebody's looking at this and them or somebody that they love is, is thinking about a career, why, why would manufacturing maybe be right for them? And, and what about it gets you excited to get up and go to work every morning? What what get me excited every day to get up and go to work every morning is something here every day that you can learn new and it's something that you can take out and actually apply it at home. And um, it's something that you can look forward to and the skills that you gain, you can take with you throughout life. And uh, it's a, it's just a great experience and I recommend it to anybody that's actually want to put that hard work in and, uh, be committed and having a career in manufacturing. This is a great close. Uh, I'm, I am lucky to be on this screen with three of our most important constituents, starting with the employers. Jack, thank you for sharing uh, on behalf of many of the manufacturers in the sector partnership. Jill, as a leader in our workforce community and representing many of our workforce partners, thank you very much. And, and our guest of honor today, Corey, as, as an example of us bringing new talent and exciting life into our manufacturing community. Really appreciate all of you guys being a part of this today. I will kick back to Cassie to close out the webinar. That was great. I thought that Adam and Jill really spoke to the community support that their organizations provided, such as post-placement coaching and the sector partnership leadership, which really made this program possible. Can you believe it grew from six manufacturers to over 20? And Jack, as a CEO, illuminated how successful a program like this can be. And I think it would be every leader's dream to have a Corey on their team who believes in the company culture and has, and has developed a love for their work. Truly, you could see from that panel that collaboration was the essential piece that made it work. I want to reiterate Towards Employment's role in the success of this model. This population has barriers and responsibilities that many of us may not think of, such as needing to show up for parole visits or transportation challenges or lack of reliable housing. That is why it's helpful to have an organization like Towards Employment at the table to help support you your new team and your new team members and be able to retain them. I can almost guarantee that in every one of your communities, there's a similar workforce development organization that, that can support you in second chance hiring. Not all of them will look the same or have the same experiences, but as I stated earlier, myself and the team at the, I, at the MI wanna help support you in making those relationships as successful as they can be. A second takeaway I want to mention is the employer collaborative. Ohio is a leader in the sector partnership model, but this is something that can happen in all of your communities. Working with other employers in your region on second chance hiring will make you more successful. I believe basically all workforce development programs that are embedded with collaboration lead to higher quality programs. There's so much opportunity for partnership. None of you should feel like this is something you have to do alone, which is a perfect segue into our final panel of the webinar. I'm going to be joined by Alex Love and Matt Joyce. They're both members of the Level Set team and are experts as second chance hiring consultants. We will discuss some of the first steps to get started in your second chance hiring journey based on what you've learned here today. Another quick reminder to post on social media about your takeaways from the webinar using the hashtag second chance workforce. All right, let's jump in with Matt and Alex. All right, let's start with some introductions. Matt, let's start with you and then we'll hear from Alex. Great, thanks Cassie. Uh, my name is Matt Joyce. I'm a partner at Level Set and we're collaborating with the Manufacturing Institute on the Second Chance Initiative and more broadly work with employers on fair chance hiring practices, uh, working on HR policies and practices on community partnerships and helping employers uh, sort of coach and train their teams and prepare for implementation. Thank you, Matt. Uh, I'm Alex at Level Set, and really excited for this conversation today. Great. We're so excited to have you here today. 
Um, earlier, we heard from Jeff, who talked about the business case for second chance hiring. Matt, tell us a little bit about how a company leader or employee can make the case to internal leadership on the rationale to implement second chance hiring as an intentional strategy for filling positions. Yeah, well, Jeff is the expert on the macroeconomic case uh, and glad we started there. I think it's important to just recognize that this uh, group of candidates represents a really outstanding and motivated pool for, for companies to tap into. Um, I think even more um, sort of specifically, the, the candidates that come through second chance pipelines um, are often some of the most sort of dedicated, excited uh, employees that you can have. I think what we see in the data is particularly strong retention rates, uh, strong advancement rates, uh, certainly no more incidences of termination among this pool. So I think as employers are thinking about uh, a group of candidates that can really stay and move forward with the company, that, uh, that this is an excellent pool to consider. I also think a lot of employers come at this recognizing that criminal justice reform and second chance hiring is something that people are looking for in, in both the places that they, uh, that they shop and that they uh, are, interact with, and also employees coming in. Um, I think what we've seen in the polling is that uh, employees want to work for a company that, uh, that cares about fair chance hiring, that cares about um, sort of the way in which the company interacts with the community. And so I think it's a great message to send to, to your employees that, uh, that you know, we are involved in, and sort of uh, work with, uh, with our communities in a productive way. Yeah, and I think that's a great transition. I'm actually gonna stick with you, Matt. Um, can you tell us about the role that community partnerships play in recruitment strategies and kind of the first step for an employer who wants to partner with someone in their community on second chance hiring? Yeah, I think that the, the reentry organizations, uh, groups that are working with folks coming back from the justice system, supporting those transitions are often the best place to start for employers. I think a lot of employers we work with uh, understand that this is a great candidate pool, but aren't really sure how to access folks who have justice involvement, sort of where to, to begin their recruitment strategy. Uh, I think every community has uh, you know, a group of, of organizations that uh, is there supporting folks with, with that transition and helping people who have justice involvement get back into the workforce, figure out kind of what they're motivated by, what they're passionate about. Um, we, we have a few things that we look for in a successful community partnership. So I think we really look for organizations that have a, some kind of upfront work readiness program. I think it's, it's a good signal that it's an employer that's not just taking people and trying to push them directly into jobs, but uh, that's, that's helping folks kind of get ready, set expectations, ready themselves. And, and from a candidate perspective, it also means that, uh, that the candidates have gone through some sort of preparation and, and readiness and, uh, and are, are that much more trained and, and uh, ready for the workforce. I also think that we're, we look for organizations that stick with employees long after they're placed. And I think the strongest community partners are those that have a job coach or a, a support uh, mechanism in place that as people have bumps along the road or as people need other resources that, that they're there three months in, six months into the job and can triangulate between the candidate and the employer and just be a continued resource. That's great. And I know that our audience heard from Towards Employment on our last panel, and they have a lot of those examples exactly of what you're talking about. So um, aligns really well with our conversation today. Um, Alex, I wanted to turn to you now. Um, we know it's a best practice to have an open and honest conversation with an applicant about their background. What advice or suggestions or best practices would you offer on application and interview guidance for manufacturers? Thank you, Cassie. That's such a great question. Uh, one that we get a lot. I think the number one thing I want folks to think about as it relates to interviews um, and application is really what's the experience of the candidate. Um, and so love to have people look at what their application is um, and really take a look at when are you asking about convictions um, and whether or not folks have had that. And take a look at whether you can move that step in the process to later down the road when you're actually giving folks uh, a conditional offer. Um, 
that way that you can actually assess folks on their skills and whether they are ready for the role um, and then talk about that possibility of having justice involvement later down the road. Um, one of the other things uh, that's really important is making sure that employers are really communicating that they are second chance employers, right? So that folks know when they're applying um, that they have a shot at the job um, and that their conviction is not going to necessarily bar them from that role. Um, it's really important to think about how folks are feeling as they're going through your application process. Thanks, Alex. Those were all really helpful points. Um, Matt, I wanted to turn back to you. What is one best practice that you encourage companies to think about when they're considering background checks and secondary reviews beyond removing the box? So, so I'm going to sneak in two, if I can. Uh, <laughs> yes. I think that, that uh, one thing that, that comes up a lot in our work with employers is, uh, is the look back period or the period that, that folks uh, or background check providers are, are sort of looking for convictions in the history of a candidate. Uh, I think we find a lot of employers start looking back in perpetuity. Um, so a candidate who might be 45 years old did something in their teens and it, it is on their record and it comes up in their record, but really isn't relevant to their, to their life or to their experience now. Uh, I think what we've seen in the data, particularly in recidivism data, is that for candidates whose, uh, whose conviction was more than two or three years ago, um, you know, the, the likelihood of reoffense or the likelihood of that coming into their lives again is, is very low. So we strongly encourage employers to really limit that look back period to what seems like a relevant period of time. The, the other one I'll, I'll say that's related is, um, is we really encourage employers to, to minimize the use of what we talk about as hard stops. Right. So as employers are, are sort of building their matrix, looking across every possible conviction and every possible job within their company, um, there's often a set of red lights and yellow lights and green lights that uh, that employers are using. And I think what what we really see is that that uh, <laughs> replacing the red lights with the yellow lights uh, and giving employees or candidates an opportunity to talk through the context of their conviction, the context of what's what's happened since. Uh, is, is a way to, to give folks more of an opportunity to be looked at as an individual on a case-by-case -case basis. So I think taking out some of those hard stops and really inviting every candidate who has a conviction that shows up on their record to just discuss the circumstances of that conviction and, and see if there's a fit. I think those are great. And I think that leads really well into my next question, Alex. Let's hope that companies take what Matt just said into consideration and leave it to some more yellow lights so they have some more individuals coming in and getting hired. Um, what should manufacturers think about on how to then retain these individuals once they are hired? Thanks, Cassie. Um, well, one thing I'll say just to start is that I would love for employers to start thinking about retention before you've even hired someone, right? Like, are your managers ready to support people? Um, do they have you know, the communication skills to support, but also are they aware of collateral consequences? Um, a lot of times with our clients, we will do trainings with managers so that they have an understanding of what folks uh, might be facing as they are uh, rejoining uh, the community. Um, additionally, thinking about you know, continuous growth and development. Do folks have the opportunity to continue to develop themselves, continue to develop those skills, and really have an understanding of what that next step in their career is. Um, those are all really great things to think about um, to make sure that your employees are engaged. That's amazing. Um, well, before we wrap up with both of you today, um, I am excited to say that we have some resources coming out very soon that you all have been really like helpful in getting together with us. Um, but one question I like to ask before we round it out is, what is one thing that you want everyone to know? There's gonna be a lot of individuals who are joining this call and this webinar today um, who may have never been engaged in second chance hiring or didn't know a lot before they joined. Um, what's one thing that you really want them to leave today with? Uh, I'll start with Matt and then we can go to Alex. Uh, I'd like everyone to know that, uh, that 
this candidate pool has been uh, an untapped resource for uh, for decades and decades. I think what what we've learned just in in the data is that people with with previous convictions have an unemployment rate uh, of about five times the the amount that uh, that the baseline does. And so for companies that are really trying to figure out creative ways to bring on qualified people, I think this has been such an overlooked candidate pool. And just the fact that the Manufacturing Institute is having this conversation and all of the, the companies involved are starting to think about this is just a great indicator that we're starting to look at this candidate pool much more as an asset than a liability and, and that it can just be a, a great group to focus your recruitment efforts on. Mm -hmm. And I think the last thing that I would say is just um, that there's a lot more, I think, understanding and awareness as it relates to Second Chance in terms of folks um, having family members and people in their community that have had past convictions. And so there is more of a general comfort as it relates to supporting our community and our families uh, that might have been justice involved. Well, thank you. Those were both great things to leave us with. Thank you, Matt. And thank you, Alex. Um, I learned a lot today from both of you. Thanks, Cassie. Yeah. I hope you all learned a lot from that conversation. One of the important takeaways for me was the concept of the red, yellow, and green lights. Think how impactful it would be if we all moved more yellow lights, giving people the opportunity to discuss their convictions and circumstances. The other takeaway that I would share from that conversation is the idea of communicating that you're a second chance employer. I think those of you who decide to make this an intentional strategy for your organization will be surprised by the positive impact it has on you personally your company, and your community. You'll want to tell everyone about being a second chance employer. I have to say, one of the most rewarding parts of this work for me so far is getting to hear people's stories. For example, an individual who was incarcerated since they were a teenager, released after 20 years, looking for their first job. Not their first job after incarceration, their first job ever. And found employment in manufacturing to be a rewarding career that allows them to have a life where they can support themselves and their community. Another example is an individual who went to their first job interview after incarceration, who was able to have an open and honest conversation about their conviction because of the preparation they had done with a community-based organization. They were hired for an entry-level role and are now a supervisor. Truly, there's nothing better than seeing the impact that this work can have. Overall, today's conversation was just the beginning. As I mentioned, we've released the first two resources on our website, go check them out. One is the case for second chance hiring and the second is on the best practices for inclusive HR. We'll be releasing more in the coming weeks, resources specifically on the retention and community partnerships. So be on the lookout for those. Our goal with this work is to empower you at the local level to make this a success for your organization. Reach out to us at secondchance at nam.org to let us know how we can help you or answer questions that you have. We'll be having more sessions like this this summer as a learning series on specific topics so we can go deeper into each of these important areas. I hope you all learned as much as I did today and are as excited about the opportunities that Second Chance Hiring can bring for your company and your community. And if you take nothing else away from today, remember that you have organizations that are ready and willing to partner with you. We at the Manufacturing Institute are looking forward to working with you to prepare you for this work. Collaboration and partnership are your keys to success. Thanks for joining us today.